All right, we have a lot of ground to cover this morning, and I'm going to try to do it in the most timely fashion that I can. And believe me, when I started this series on, on judgment, um, and I'm only going to give you three parts. There was actually two, I think maybe even a, another third part. So there might be six in total. So we might have to revisit this another time uh, and just to do like kind of tie it off and finish like the, the whole kind of judgment thing. But really, we've been talking about uh, the, the, the three types of judgment that affect us the most. Last week, I kind of laid a bit of an overview about what, what judgment is. Of course, if you were here for that, you learned that judgment first comes to the church, right? So we ought to be really, really careful, you know, when we're, when we're feeling judgy, <laughs> when we're feeling like somebody wronged us and we're like, oh, get them, God, judge them, you know, like, ooh, be careful, be careful. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He didn't say vengeance is yours. He said vengeance is mine. So we're just going to put it in the hands of the Father because, I mean, think about it. When you're the one who's the object of potential judgment, you're looking out for a little mercy too, aren't you? Come on, let's be real. You want a little mercy too. Like, ah, was it really that bad? I'm not as bad as this guy, you know? <laughs> you always find, yeah, find that person that you feel like maybe did a little worse than you and, uh, and, and try to evade a little bit. But it's really important that we understand what judgment is, how it works, how it operates. And uh, I kind of said all that to say this, that I, I did my best to kind of keep this all into a... Um, uh, presentable, like a tight, a tight little sermon so that you guys could kind of get it all at once and didn't have to leave you with a cliffhanger. If we met now and then we had a break for two hours and then, you know, met again, then we could continue a little bit. But as it is, this is what we got. So we're going we're gonna to go with it, okay? So um, if you weren't here for uh, the last message that I taught on judgment, the overview of judgment, you need to get onto YouTube and watch that message, Okay. And then you can also double down and go to our podcast, and you can dive in a lot deeper on that message because we hit it uh, basically Tuesday through Thursday. We hit these messages, and we just try to go a little bit deeper and give you guys some of the things that we wish we could have said, but we could, they, they kind of, they're in the editing room floor. You know, they don't actually make it to the Sunday morning, but they're still good, and they're, they're great for discussion and for growth uh, in, in, your own, uh, in your own walk with the Lord. So if you haven't heard that message, it's really important that you go back and listen to it. Uh, and coming into this message, all you really need to know in a nutshell is that when judgment comes, it comes to the church first. So when we look around at America or the world and we think, oh, they're embracing sin, look at all this secular type of living, this is every, everybody's made such a mess out of everything, and then we see a flood or a hurricane or a famine and we go, oh, that's judgment. We're tempted to say that's judgment. No, those are, those are actually groanings of the earth in that case, the one I, that I just mentioned, like the earth's groaning because the earth is dealing with sin. Uh, but judgment's first going to come to the church, and I, I had explained to you guys that we are God's children and that God isn't interested in, in disciplining the neighbor kids. He's going to discipline his own kids first. That's where, that's where uh, judgment comes first. So it first comes to the church. Now, uh, I hate to break it to you guys, but... The state of the church globally uh, is in disrepair. I know, not really that good news. You're like, Pastor, this is not uplifting, and I apologize. But the, yeah, that's the silver lining, right? That's, we got we to gotta be real with the problem so we can start working on it, don't we? We really do. I think there's a lot of pastors around the earth who are just trying to be cool, trying to be relevant, trying to be flashy, Worship leaders who would rather be worshipped themselves than, than lead people into the throne room. Faltering attendance met with this embrace of unrighteousness and compromise. People throwing sin in our face so long. and You know, if you tell a person a lie long enough and loud enough, they'll start to believe it. So you'd better be careful, Christian. You'd better be careful. Because the world loves sin. It loves to embrace sin. And it would love nothing more than to get you to embrace it as well and be like, oh, yeah, you can embrace your sin and come be a Christian. Yeah, that's cool. We can see how God would, would be good with that. And you might think that this is a new problem. Like, look around the earth. I know that, you know, some of us haven't been on the earth that long. And our only experience with the earth is the time that we've had on it, honestly. And so you might think, like, wow, this is a new problem. I can't believe all this despair uh, in the earth and, and all, these, the, all this embrace of unrighteousness. And this surely points to the nearness of Christ's coming. And, 
And I would agree to a, a certain degree that, yes, these things do point toward the coming of Christ, but what's happening right now doesn't necessarily mean this is the end all. You guys understand that, right? The, the earth's been spinning quite a while, um, and we don't know when Christ is coming back. It could be spinning for quite a while longer. We, we don't actually know. So um, best bet is to uh, make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, get right with God, and then let him sort out the details. You know, just, just let him sort it out. Or maybe you've looked at the world as it is today. You've looked at society. You've looked at the current state of the church specifically, and you said, you know what? These pastors are just trying to be cool. The worship leaders want to be worshiped. They're just out to steal my money, all this other stuff. He's like, you know what? I can feed myself. I'm just going to feed myself. I know how to get into the word. I know how to pray. I know how to study. I'm, I'm just going to feed myself. Well, that's really, really dangerous territory. It's, it's unbiblical. Um, God, did, he does want you to feed yourself. He does want you to grow up and be mature and be able to do those things. But he also said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. He wants us to figure out how to do life together, guys, not how to be isolated. Guess what? Heaven's not going to be a lonely place. There's going to be lots and lots of people there, and you're going to have to figure out how to live with them, okay? So I just saw all the introverts slink in their chair just a little bit, but um, God's going to work in your heart, and, and it'll be all good. But you might think that this is like uh, a, a, a new problem, but in, in 1 Samuel, in, in chapter 2, starting in verse 12, there's a record of this high priest named Eli who had a bunch of wicked sons. How many of you guys are familiar with this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to that scripture just to get us all on the same page. But uh, Eli and his sons, his sons were priests also, but Eli was like in charge of his sons. And as it turns out, his sons had no respect for their duties as priests. For my Nacho Libre fans, their priestly duties, right? <laughs> they, had, they had all these duties to do. I know, I'm sorry. I'd, I swore I wasn't going to do that this morning. I, I, can't help, I can't help it. It's like a disease. Anyways, so his sons have no respect for, for what they're supposed to be doing. They're, they're, seriously, they're, they're delegating responsibilities that weren't supposed to be delegated. Okay, so they're, in leadership, there's lots of responsibilities, like Stacy alluded to some of them this morning. Lots and lots of responsibilities, and many of them can be delegated. Some of them cannot be delegated. Okay, so they were, they were shirking their responsibilities. The things that were theirs to carry, they were like, I don't really want to do that. I can't be bothered with that. Why don't, why don't you do that? So, so they were delegating responsibilities that were supposed to be theirs. They were abusing the sacrifices of the people. So people had to bring in sacrifices, right? You guys remember this according to Levitical law. They had to bring in certain sacrifices for certain sins, and the priests had to cut them up certain ways and burn them in a certain order and all that other. You guys remember that, right? Yeah. Okay, so... Um, so they're, they're abusing the sacrifices. They were stealing the tithes. They were seducing women, in some cases, on the steps of the church. Yeah, right? Tall tree, short rope. Like, I think we, I think we know what's happening here. And, and Eli was complicit in all of this because as it was going on, rather than dealing with it, he just kind of gave his sons a pass or slapped him on the wrist. And he's like, you guys, come on. You know you're not supposed to do that. You know, and like, whoa, Eli, hold up, bud. And because of this, God sent a prophet to warn Eli and those of his family anointed to serve that they would be completely wiped out. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a big God spank, don't you think? 1 Samuel 2.31, it says, The time is coming when I will put an end to your family. Wow. So it will no longer serve as my priests. All the members of your family will die before their time. No one will reach old age. Okay, so you guys have a time. You know that? There's a whole other message here. You guys have an appointed time. You know that, right? God has given you an appointed time, a time to live and a time to die. Now, sadly, there's lots of examples recorded in the Bible that are similar to this, that are similar to Eli and his sons and what they were doing. And it basically goes like this. It's this old gem. I'm sure you've heard it. God establishes a people. He establishes a church. The people embrace sin. Leadership is weak-handed, and God is left with no recourse except judgment. We see it again and again and again, kind of this repeating problem we see in the Bible. And some of you might think that some things aren't being judged soon enough. I'll tell you what, I was getting really, really un, un, unpatient with America and its embrace, like our Holocaust, its, in, it's embrace of abortion and, and the way people would 
fight. You could see in there, they would just fight for the right to, to kill other humans. It's, and I was getting really impatient, you know? And, but I was tempted to think that God was, wasn't, yeah, what, like, where are you at? Like, how, where, where are you at? But God's merciful. He is merciful, and he is long-suffering. And he continuously bends over backward to make every way possible for his children to repent. That's the God you serve. That's how good God is. Check out this scripture, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. Some people think that, don't we think that sometimes, don't we? But not really. He's not really being slow. He's being patient. For who? For your sake. He's being patient for your sake. Isn't that amazing? He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. That is the heart of your father. And this was true from the beginning of God's dealing with the sin nature of man. This was true right from the beginning in the garden. Directly after the fall of man, God asks Adam in Genesis 3.8, where are you? Do you think God knew where Adam was? Pretty sure. Pretty sure that God knew where Adam was. And he knew what happened to his beloved creation. He knew what happened. And Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked. And to this, God asks, who told you that you were naked? Interesting. And then he asks him, have you eaten from the tree? God knows where Adam was. God knows who told Adam he was naked. And he knows that Adam had committed treason from eating from the tree. He knew all those things. In his kindness, God provided an opportunity for Adam to repent and come to him in humility. Dad, messed up. Gave me this one thing. I messed up. But instead, sin nature, true to its nature, was on full display from moment one. He was expressing the effect of sin. Adam, who once joined the deepest fellowship with the loving father, begins to point fingers instead of just humbling himself and coming clean before God. Now, it's been said, you guys have probably heard it, that Christianity is always one generation from becoming extinct. And I hope you believe that because it's true. We have a job to do, believing believers. We have work to do in this place. Some of you are doing it right now, dragging your kids to church. Some of you are inviting your friends to church and your family. And pay attention. Come on. This is important. This is more important than all those other things that keep you interested. These are the things that have eternal value. This is what's important. But we understand that the church is made up of broken people. Wow. No amens. The church is made up of broken people. You guys got it all together? Am I the only one who's willing to admit I don't have this thing figured out? I don't. I don't have this thing figured out. I make mistakes, lots of them. But like Paul, sometimes he said, man, I I struggle always doing the right thing. Paul lamenting about his sin nature in the book of Romans said, I don't really understand myself. I don't get it. I don't understand. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Why do we do that? It's that nature that's that's in us. So I'm going to try to just keep this on topic here. Keep this about judgment. To make it really, really simple, and I know that there's, I know there's more, but I just I wanted to split it into, into three groups to make it easy. There's, there's at least two more, um, the white throne judgment and the, the believer's judgment. There's those two as well, so just in your mind's eye, put them below these. But just to keep things simple, we want to talk about these three portions of judgment. First, we talk about the church, judgment over the church, right? And then believers, judgment within the church. That's what we're talking about today judgment within the church. And then I'm going to tie this message off with judgment outside the church, how we're supposed to to deal with people who are not believers, people who are not Christians, um, people who are uh, not part of the thing, okay? So uh, 
Judgment comes, it first comes to the church. Does everybody understand that? Yes? Okay, so wise leadership within the church is paramount. Do you agree? Wise leadership within the church is absolutely paramount. Pastors who don't compromise. Pastors who don't allow compromise in their churches. Okay, well, I'm glad that you said amen and thank you because that's where things get spicy. Pastors who don't allow. What? Who are you to judge me? Who are you to say that about me? Who are, who are you? Thank you. It is my job. Uh, and uh, I'm going to kind of get into that here in a little bit. But here's the deal. These leaders, these wise leaders must also demonstrate the Father's heart toward people. That is to realize that we are all on a journey, that no one is perfect, and that true repentance looks like something. So you might look around the church and see somebody else in the church and be like, why isn't pastor dealing with that? Why isn't pastor addressing that? Believe me, pastor sees it. Believe me. And pastor is also looking for repentance and movement, looking on the best we can with the Father's heart, going, look, we're all a broken people. I'm not dismissing sin. I'm not excusing the embrace of sin. Somebody's like, man, I really struggle with this thing. I need some help. I keep messing up. Come on, we got a journey together. We got to get through this together. Somebody who says, this is my sin, and I love it, and you can either accept me and my sin, or I'm out. I'm going to say, we'll see ya. You understand now? Okay. 1 John 2, 5 through 6 says, but those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. Come on, they truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God could live their lives as Jesus did. Repentance looks like something. You can't just say, I repent. It will manifest in your lifestyle. It will look like something. You'll be able to point to it and say it. That's why when pastors have to make hard decisions and somebody says, why did you make that hard decision? You say, they weren't showing any signs of repentance. Who are you to judge? God's delegated authority. That's who. You understand? That's who. In the fifth chapter of Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, we find him dealing with this sin that has been allowed to grow within the church. Some of you probably remember. And what you must understand is that people are people, no matter where you are on this earth or what era or geographical location you find yourself in, sin is the issue. Sin is the issue. And if you've never traveled abroad, I strongly suggest that you guys take at least a couple of trips to other countries and just find out that, like, you know, what we're getting in, in news and pop culture and, and it's, it's people are people and they're kind and they're loving and, and they, care for other, they care for others. They're trying to live their life. You know, they're trying to raise their families. They're doing, this, they're doing the same kind of stuff we're doing, you know? So they're not so, like, America-centric, but, you know, just living their lives. Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, God created people to be virtuous. Yay. But they have each turned to follow their own downer path. Boo. <laughs> so he created us for this purpose, but we've all kind of done our own thing, haven't we? And because of that, Paul left parishioners and pastors with some instruction that we would be wise to follow. See, too often we're pointing the finger to the world and boasting of ourselves rather than humbling ourselves and dealing with the log in our own eye. Dealing with the stuff that's in our own world, in the church. Right? I'm talking about things that are happening within the church. And this next bit of information is very important, so I want you guys to really lock in, okay? Don't, don't drift on me because um, it's going to take me a minute to set it up, but I need you guys to just stay with me. because This, this is life-changing, okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 5.11, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is a sexually immoral person or a greedy person or an idolater or is verbally abusive, or habitually drunk, or a swindler, not even to eat 
with such a person. This is Paul's instruction for Christian believers. And we're going to come back to this, but there's basically uh, these pillars of holiness. You guys are like, how do I live a holy life? Paul spells them out for us. You know, in jujitsu, we have a whole set of pillars, and I make, our, I make our team say it like every time we close. Matter of fact, they'll probably join me when I say it. Benevolence, courage, courage. honor, honesty, loyalty, respect, and rectitude. So now you know who not to mess with in this house, okay? <laughs> um, anybody who knows those things, you don't want to, don't pick a fight with those guys. Okay, but Paul left us seven pillars as well, these pillars of holiness. Sexual purity, generosity, loyalty, gentleness, sobriety, honesty, and integrity. If you want to live a holy life, this is what you must do. Here's the standard. Here are your pillars. Is this making sense? Here they are. Right here. Okay? Those are the pillars to holiness. These are the standards by which believers should judge within the church. Did you hear me? These are the standards with which believers should judge within the church. You getting that? We are specifically instructed to judge believers by biblical standards, but not unbelievers. Let's look again at this chapter, but I'm going to start you guys off a little bit earlier. I'm going to start you off in verse 9. And I tried to help you out with some highlights here so you guys could see this. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not at all mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with greedy and swindlers or with idolaters for then you would have to leave the world. But actually, and this is the scripture we just read, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is a sexually immoral person or a greedy person or an idolater or is verbally abusive or a habitual drunk or a swindler, not even to eat with such a person. Believers, that's you, are only to judge other believers by biblical standards. And I know what you're thinking. Well, what about all the sinners of the world? I didn't say God couldn't judge them by biblical standards. I said you can't. <laughs> you're not God. Sorry to break it to you. You are a believer, and the, other, the only people that you should judge by biblical standards is other believers. Look at verse 12 if you don't believe me. For what business of mine is it to judge outsiders? That ain't none of my business. Do you not judge those who are within the church? Rhetorical. But those who are outside, God judges. We must, I use that word on purpose, we must judge those within the church on biblical standards because God will judge us, the church, first. You understand why it was so important? Why the last time I spoke, we drilled down on that point that God will bring it to the church. That's why it's so important that within the church, we hold each other accountable to biblical standard. You guys see it? It's God's job to judge unbelievers. It's our job to love them. Come on, we got the easy job. We can, our hardest, the hardest part about doing our job, about loving sinners, is other believers. But listen, we're warned to be careful. We're warned to be wise. We're warned to be strong in our convictions so that we're not deceived by the sins of the world and by the habits of the unrighteous. We're to be people of light in the darkness, the ambassadors of the kingdom. Not to be unequally yoked, 
But Paul's saying, if you can't be friends with those people, you're going to have to get out of the world. Those people exist. Okay? I didn't say don't be friends with those people. Those people need Christ. They need to repent. They need the power of God in their lives. These people have already repented, supposedly. They have the power of God or access to it, and they're just denying it. They're denying that power in their lives. Those are the people. Like, hey, you don't want to be around those people who deny the power of God in their lives. You cannot embrace sin and embrace Christianity. No matter how you try to justify it, you cannot. Okay? There is a standard by which we as believers are commanded to judge unbelievers by. And I'm going to talk to you guys about that Next time we speak, in part three, okay? There is a standard by which we must follow when we bring judgment outside of the church, but it ain't biblical standard. You follow me? Okay. But what are we to do about the church? Does pastor have a right to confront someone? Does pastor have a right to ask somebody to leave? Boy, that's a strange thought for us, isn't it? especially those of us who suffer from entitlement. <laughs> and if that occurs, and if the pastor does ask somebody to leave, and if the pastor has to have this hard conversation with somebody, how should I take it? I'm talking about you guys. How do, I, how do you take it? What do you do? Can you believe pastor said such and such to so-and-so? They didn't even go to church here anymore. I'm going to take up an offense for that person. I'm not even going to go to church there anymore. Listen, Paul, dealing with a man who was sexually involved with his stepmother, ugh, said to the church who condoned it, this is what he said, 1 Corinthians 5, 2 and 5, it says, you've become arrogant, that's what he told the church, judgment comes to the church first. He didn't swing his sword at the kid. <laughs> You have become arrogant. You've not mourned. So that one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. I have decided, this is a whole series all by itself, this one sentence. I have decided to turn such a person over to Satan for the destruction of his body so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. And 1 Corinthians 5.13 says, remove, someone say remove, Remove the evil person from among yourselves. So we see this type of judgment again in Paul's first letter to Timothy at the end of chapter 1. Paul is instructing, he's exhorting young Tim to keep the faith in good conscience. And he says, which some have rejected. He said, keep the faith in good conscience, which some have rejected. So we reject the faith by trying to live a born-again life, but continually and willingly holding on to our sin habits and make matters worse by trying to convince others that it's okay to do so. Do you guys understand what I'm talking about? There are some sins in this life that have become mainstream. And there's a lot of people with a lot of political clout and a lot of money and a lot of movement trying to make this sin embraced in the world. Are you seeing it? Listen, we reject the faith by trying to live a born-again life while simultaneously holding on to what we know to be unrighteous. God said, this is sin. We take on the voice of the enemy when we say, but did God say this was sin? Did he really mean what he said? Look, that's the voice of the accuser. That's not the voice of Adam, who struggled with sin nature. That is the voice of the enemy, who lied to him. God said, I've given you all of it. I've given you everything. That's exactly what Satan said, right? He came in and said, did God really give you everything? Is that really what he did? This book's so old can't actually, I mean, maybe that was like really relevant for their time, but I mean, come on, it's 2020. 
Guys, we reject the faith by trying to live a born-again life and continually holding on to our sin habits. I'm not saying that you can't be born again and still sin. That, you're never going to get away from that until you can shed this body. But we recognize sin for what it is, and we address it as such, we treat it as such, and we deal with it appropriately. That's what I'm talking about. So sin nature will always try to justify itself. Sin nature will always cloak the behavior in biblical reasoning, but not biblical truth. And that's exactly like the story that Pastor Tanya shared with you last week in her message, Twisted Christian. If you haven't heard that message, go back and listen to it. There was these guys in the synagogue, the leaders of the synagogue, and they were doing the right thing. They, they were cloaking their behavior in biblical reasoning, but not biblical truth. We say, oh, it's, it's love. How could God be against love? Hmm. Sounds like humanism to me, right? Oh, it just feels so good. You know, I've had a lot of people in my office for counseling in the last couple of decades. And I'm telling you, I've heard every excuse for every sin, every justification. Any sin you can imagine, I've heard somebody justify it. Oh, but it just feels so good. And I'm not hurting anybody. How could God be against something that feels so good and doesn't hurt anybody? We're always trying to justify our sin for God. How can I just walk on that line? These people existed in the early church as they do today. In our church. And Paul said to Tim in 1 Tim 1.20, among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Pretty serious subject matter, you guys. But you can't just be judging everybody like willy-nilly, right? You'd be like, whoa, pastor said I'm allowed to judge within the church, you know? Right? Let's get out your checklist. Ah, oh, I've been meaning to get that guy. He parked in my spot twice. <laughs> twice. I counted. I put it on my calendar. Isn't it bad? Right? And then you walk in and someone's in your seat. <laughs> Look, guys, there isn't some group of perfect people that are voting other people in the church off the island. That's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> It's laughably ridiculous. I'm glad that you laughed at it. <laughs> in 3 John, we learn about this power-hungry pastor named Diotrephes. If you guys are in my brother's uh, class, you, you know very well because you've been reading it and reading it and reading it. And he was the kind of pastor that would put people out of the church for disagreeing with him. You catch that? So Diotrephes was the kind of pastor that would just put people out of the church. All right, and here's what I want you to learn. 3 John 9 and 10, I wrote to the church about this, but Diotrephes, who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, I will report some of the things he is doing and the evil accusations he's making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others not to help them. And when they do help, he puts them out of the church. Specifically, Pastor Diotrephes didn't want to welcome or support missionaries. That was his shtick for whatever reason. He just didn't want to. And anybody who disagreed with him at that point was put out of the church. So John writes to tell him that he intends on confronting Pastor Diotrephes about his refusal to welcome or support missionaries, but not about putting people out of the church. Interesting. Diotrephes' reasoning to put people out was in error. It was. It was in poor taste. However, John never challenges Pastor Diotrephes' authority to manage his flock. He encourages the believers not to let his bad example influence them and instead to follow what is good.
interesting. So Pastor Diotrephes, using some poor judgment, managing his flock poorly, yet nothing in argument about his ability to manage his flock. Are you catching this? So as for you guys, as for parishioners, if this kind of judgment is made by your pastors, what should your response be? How do you respond to that? Do you take up offense? I'm leaving too. What do you do? Well, the Bible says what you should do. Right here in Hebrews 13, 17. It says, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Look, have I ever asked you to do something unreasonable? How long have we been here? 12 years? Have I ever asked you to do something unreasonable? Abused this position? And I say, well, oh, this other pastor in some other state, he abuses it. Well, don't hold me accountable for what somebody else is doing. I haven't done that to you. And I never will. And that's why I can say this with a straight face, because I've not abused it. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work, my work, is to watch over your souls. And I am accountable to God. Come on, give me reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. Please. <laughs> Please. That would certainly be for your benefit. In verse 7, it says, think of all the good that has come from our lives. Think of all the good that's come from your, your leadership's lives. This ministry. Think of all the good that's come from this house. Think of all that good. And follow our example of faith. 1 Thessalonians 5.12, if that wasn't enough for you, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard. Thank you. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peaceably with each other. That makes my work so much more of a joy when you guys can live peacefully with each other, forgive one another totally. If you have an offense with somebody else, work it out with that person. Okay, Live peacefully with one another. Makes my life a little easier. According to Acts 20, 28, God has ordained pastors to be overseers of the flock. That's our job. And pastors have to serve knowing the pending judgment in Hebrews 13. You think I'm not aware of that? You think I haven't considered this? Believe me, I consider it a lot more than you do. I live with it. Sleepless nights, I live with it. And without the anointing, the weight of it would destroy you. That's why when people are like, man, I feel like man, I want to be a pastor. You better talk to God about it. You better be sure that there's nothing else that I want to do. This job is absolute life to me, but I've been called to it. I've been anointed for it. God's given me the mantle to carry it. And I know for sure that it would crush you if you did not have the mantle for it. If you did not have the, uh, that burden in your heart, it would, it would crush you. The weight of the judgment that's on an, a, a leader who's guiding a whole group of people, the weight of it would it would destroy you if you, weren't, if you weren't called to it. And I'm not saying, oh, look how cool I am. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that God anoints people to do certain jobs, and it's important to do the job that God has called you to do. That's, that's your life calling. It's what, it's what you should do. And the things that he's called you guys to do, I can't do them. You know, that's why I'm always begging you guys to do your thing, right? I'm doing my thing. I'm asking you guys to do your thing, you know, because to, together we can do a thing. Okay, cool. You know, we also know uh, that those in leadership are judged more harshly. That's another burden that we carry. Uh, not by God. We're not judged more harshly by God. We're judged more harshly by the people we serve and the people who look on. <laughs> people who don't even go to this church, who blow up my phone with hate messages about what I'm doing wrong and how I should run this ministry and if I was really this or really that. Okay. Okay. 
And you might think that that doesn't matter, but I'm telling you, uh, the enemy slings arrows, and we try to block them. You can't block them all. Some of them hit home. You know what I mean? And they're directed. We get it. We forgive you. Amen? We forgive you. In fact, we invite that kind of righteous judgment. Tanya and I invite that kind of judgment. We want you to judge us. Why? Because I want to earn your trust, and I promise you, I will. So we welcome that. I'm not saying like, oh, don't judge us. Find this word, you know? Get it in here. We welcome it. If you're right, we'll repent and fix it. Because I don't want to go to the kingdom with that on my resume. You understand? That's called humility. But for those of you who've been walking with us for more than a decade, if we have earned your trust, you can sleep well. You don't have anything to worry about. Just sleep well, assured that we are going to do all that's in our power to keep this house safe, physically and spiritually. We're going to do all that we can, and we're going to give you the right teaching. Amen? We're going to handle it right. If something comes up, and you hear from so-and-so that something happened to so-and-so, the only advice you should give that person is, hold up, don't tell me anymore. Go to that person right now. Go to that person right now and work that thing out one-on-one. If they won't hear you, come on back. But I don't want to know anymore. You're putting me in a bad spot. Well, that sounds biblical. Okay, let's recap. Let's recap. We covered a lot of hard ground today, so I'm... Some freedom in it. Some freedom in it. All right. Judgment comes first to the church. You are to judge Christians by biblical standards. You are not to judge non-Christians by biblical standards. There's a standard for holy living described in seven parts. Here they are. Sexual purity, generosity, loyalty, gentleness, sobriety, honesty, and integrity. Pastors have the responsibility of managing their flock. It's our job. Parishioners, that's you, have the responsibility of trusting your pastors. Thank you. And I don't say that like, oh, just trust us. I'm saying we're inviting righteous judgment. And for some of you, we've earned it. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you, we haven't been walking together that long. So I would, if making a case for this ministry, uh, present to you Exhibit A, the people who trust us and found us trustworthy. You know, they're not fools. They've been walking with us. They've been listening to the word. So at least you've got some witnesses. And you can say, well, I'm going to try for myself to make sure. Good. We want you to. We want you to. But if, if we do, if we do earn your trust, then we expect that we can walk this together we're not going to ask you to do anything crazy. But if we do something that you don't understand, we're asking you to trust us. We have your best interest to heart, this church's best interest to heart, and we're going to make good decisions together with the Holy Spirit. We're going to make good decisions. You can bank on that. If you hear something bad, instead of being like, oh, I knew it. You give us the benefit of the doubt. Really? That doesn't sound like Pastor T. That doesn't sound like something you do. Wait, Pastor Dave said what? That doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. And if he did, I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation. Come on, we give you guys the benefit of the doubt every day, all day. This trust thing is a two-way street. Okay. But it's not just about us. I, I really want you, this is, this is really, that part's a little self-serving, granted. The top, this is really what's so important for you guys. I, I hope that you can be free today. You don't have to, you're not the moral police. You don't have to go to Walmart with your little morality badge going, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, I'm going to cite you for that. 
Parishioners arrest. Come to my pastor. Come on. <laughs> no, we're supposed to love them. We're supposed to love them. Show them love. And here's the really tricky part, and I'm not going to try to answer it today. I'm just going to point my finger at that big elephant in the room, is how do we love these people and not compromise our own belief? How do we love these people and not embrace the sin? That's what we have to kind of sojourn together. That's what we have to work out together. We are in this world. We're not of it. We're in it. And we're not out of it till we're out of it. So as long as we're in it, we don't have to deal with it, okay? So inside the church, other believers, you know, I had a conversation with a guy. I'll end with this little story. I had a conversation with a guy not too long ago. Uh, nobody here, just in case anybody's wondering. But I'm going to keep him anonymous anyways. You guys don't know him. But I had a conversation with this, with this guy um, based on an understanding that, that he was a believer. Like I thought, like, okay, we're on the same level Believer to believer, this is what we're going to talk about. And so I talked to him about it, and it was kind of a spicy subject. And I found out real quick, like, by his response, like, oh, oh, ooh, hey, you misrepresented yourself. I thought you were this, right? And we're, we have a different kind of relationship. You know what I mean? So I got to back it down into gear two, right, and go, okay, let's, let's start from the beginning. Let's talk about Jesus and his life and, and why you need it. You guys see what I'm saying? Okay, next time you're going to learn uh, that there is a standard by which we as believers are commanded to judge unbelievers, non-Christians. There is, there is also a standard for that, and I think you might just be surprised. So stay tuned, and I hope to see you guys. Uh, of course, Tanya's got next week covered, Pastor T, right? Okay, <laughs> and, and then you'll get, the, you'll get the conclusion to this series the week after that. Bow your heads. Let me pray for you guys. God, I just thank you. Uh, I just lift your people up to you right now, Lord. We, lo we love you so much. We honor you. We bless you, God. Uh, we, we just want to experience you in, in your fullness. We want to experience you for who you are. Lord, we want you to know our hearts. Father, I pray that you would unite us. God, that, that we would actually experience the, the fellowship of Christianity, that unity of Christianity, not the surface level unity where we're all just go do the same thing at the same time, which is fine, but like an actual heart-to-heart -heart unity, one with another, that we would link arms one with another, that we would guard one another's dignity, save each other's pride, that the outsiders would know that we are Christians by our love. My heart, God. As long as I'm on this earth, that your people would be living ambassadors of love in all forms that that looks like. From tough love to acceptance love to all that whole spectrum. God, we know that you are love. So we ask that you would reveal yourself to us so that we could be love to this world. Not Hollywood's idea of love or our fantasies of love, but what you want, how you want that demonstrated. God, I thank you that you'd empower your people. Mom, that you'd empower your people for the work of Christian service. That we would recognize that we're not here to serve ourselves. Lord, our primary function, our primary goal is to serve you. We want to live that kind of life. Lord, we trust you to move over our hearts and in our lives and in this community. We thank you for it, Lord. Come on, someone say, I receive it. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.
Amen. Those buckets are coming on by. Let's pray while they serve. Father, thank you for that word. Thank you, Lord, for that lesson. What a teaching, Lord. Praise you for it. Father, help us to continue to just soak in your message, Father. Soak in your word that we would live a life that is pleasing and in service to you. Help us, Father, to rise up to be the people that you created us to be when we were in our mother's womb. We thank you for it, Lord. We praise you for it. We continue to look to you and let that fruit grow in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Those buckets are coming by, so we'll let them continue to serve. There is um, food in the downstairs, so when we dismiss, please feel free to Go down and grab yourself a box or crate or whatever's down there. Uh, so load up. Load up for your family. Load up for somebody. We love you. Thank you so much. You can all be dismissed. Sign up for Unboxed. <laughs>